Um, before we begin the sermon today, I just want to let you know that I'm... Um, I like studying statistics, and I like understanding why the church is the way it is. As a matter of fact, when I was in college, one of my majors was church history. And it wasn't church history in the context of Adventist church history. It was church history in the context of where we came from as Christians and where we are today. And all the people that led to the things that we believe and teach today from the Bible. And one of the things that I like to look at is I like to look at research that is done by independent research companies. And uh, this kind of gives us a perspective on why the world is the way it is today in the context of religion and spirituality. One of the groups that I like to look at is called the Barna Group. And the Barna Group is a visionary, visionary research and research company, resource company, that conducts research focusing on the intersection of faith and culture. And I just want to share a few statistics that they've, since 2002, that they've um, discovered with people's uh, spirituality and how it converges with their culture. People focused on personal accomplishments, family solidarity, and emotional fulfillment is what describes most people that were part of this this research study. It says, Barna suggested that many Americans may have fallen in love with faith rather than the object of their faith, which is Jesus Christ. It is much less demanding to be, devo to do, to be devoted to the idea of faith than to invest yourself in a true relationship with the living God. They go on to say, while most of these people describe themselves as followers of Christ and say that the Bible is accurate in all of its teachings, they nevertheless believe that truth is based on feelings, experience, and emotion. People are more prone to embrace diversity, tolerance, and feeling good than judgment, discernment, righteousness, and limitations. People are more focused on temporal security than eternal security and its temporal implications. And finally, maybe the comfort afforded by our buildings and other material possessions has seduced us into thinking we're further down the road than we really are. Now, this, this is some staggering research. And uh, you're going to find out as we continue on this morning why I believe that. But before we continue, let's have a word of prayer. Dear God in heaven, I want to thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to share what you have uh, shared with me. I want to thank you, Lord, for this opportunity through the foolishness of preaching that we have to uh, come together and to learn more about what you have to share with us in your Bible. Um, please be with us all now as we open your word. And I pray, Lord, that this worship this morning will be a blessing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would please turn with me to the book of John. And we're going to start off in verse 25, or chapter 15. And we're going to start in verse 12. So John chapter 15, verse 12, and we're going to read verses 12 and 13. John chapter 15, verses 12 and 13. And the Bible reads, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Now, if we take a look at that text on the surface, most would conclude that laying down your life in love for someone means that we have to literally die. How many people would have that initial con contextual understanding of that verse? Most people do when they read that. And to some degree, it is true because that is the ultimate, that is the, if, if you want to take and put in tears the, the level of love, the greatest love is to die for someone that you love. Did Jesus not die for us because he loved us? So that, is a, that, is, that signifies the greatest um, sacrifice for love. But this can also have another meaning because the word lay in this text is the Greek word to thimi. And that word actually means to set aside. So let me read that verse, verse, verse 13, with that definition. 
Greater love has no one than this, than to set aside one's life for his friends. But to further clarify this, I want to turn back to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, if you turn with me there. And we're going to look at verse 16. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. It says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Well, let me ask you a question. If we were all right at this very instant to lay down our lives for the brethren, would we be any earthly good? No, we wouldn't. So we have to make sure that we understand the context. In one, in one way, God is talking about laying down our literal life. But this morning, what I want to focus on, I do not want to focus on laying down your literal life, but I want to talk about setting aside the life that we have here on earth. Okay? Now let me just read a couple verses. This verse that I just read by... By this we know love, because he had laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. If you read the next couple verses, it explains what that means. Verse 17. But whosoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. So you see here, the explanation for the verse that we read in the very beginning is that there's something that we must do. There's something that we must show to those people that we love for this other, for this other definition of the word, lay down your life. And this is what we're going to focus on this morning. So let's turn to Luke chapter 14. And this is where we're going to spend the majority of our time this morning. Luke chapter 14. And we're going to start in verse 25. Luke chapter 14, verse 25. It says, Now the great multitudes went with him. Now before I continue, I want to let you know that this research that I read to you first off, this research represents today's great multitude. Do you know what I mean by that? Let me explain. Back in the days of Jesus, there were people that followed him. As a matter of fact, there's several times where a, a beginning, uh, the beginning of some sort of a, a discussion or a conversation that Jesus is having starts off with a great multitude. That great multitude was, was comprised of people who, number one, wanted to follow Jesus because they really wanted to follow Jesus. There was another group of people Uh, that were part of that great multitude that were more interested in the association of following Jesus rather than following Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then there was a third group of people that wanted to follow him just because they wanted to see what he could do. Now, this this describes the great multitude that we have today, and I believe that the research that I share with you first explains a little bit of what people are like today and it could fit into one of those three categories amen so um, let's continue on because it says that he turned to the people and he said something to them let's look at verse 26 it says if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother wife and children brothers and sisters yes and his own life also he cannot be my disciple now At first, you might think that this is a paradox. Because doesn't Jesus tell us that we're supposed to love one another? Doesn't he say that we're supposed to honor our parents? But in this text, he's telling us that we have to hate them. Well, I believe in in this context here, he's using what we call a hyperbole. A hyperbole is an exaggeration for effect or something that is not supposed to be taken literally. And he's also using what they call an idiom. Or in, in our words today, we call that a figure of speech. Okay, so he's saying, listen, you have to hate your brother, sister, father, mother if you want to follow me. But if we just left it there, you'd still be thinking, no, wait a minute, it doesn't make any sense because it uses the word hate. Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, and let's find out what the word hate means. Matthew chapter 10, 
verse 37. This is what the word hate means instead of uh, resentment or uh, uh, despising someone. It says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So if we use that definition in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, we can see that this, this hate that Jesus is referring to is not something where we're supposed to um, detest someone. But what it means is that we are supposed to love them less than we would love Jesus. Amen? In other words, he is the highest level of love and everything else goes below that. Just like dying is the highest level of demonstrating our love for someone, and then it goes down from there. Well, in this context, our love for Jesus is is at the top, and everything else falls underneath that. So the word hate here does not mean detest, but it means that our relationships with other people need to pale in comparison to our relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's go on to verse 20. Um, actually, before we go on to verse 27, what I want to do is I want to break this, this, uh, these next couple of verses up into a couple chunks. This, verse, this first verse that we talked about deals with relationships. Okay, Jesus is telling us here in our relationships with other people that we need to make sure that those relationships do not take precedence over our relationships with Jesus Christ. Okay, and I'm not going to belabor this point because we need to understand that in order to have a great spiritual life and to understand who Jesus really is, it goes without saying that we have to have a, a spiritual relationship with this person. You remember in the, in the research it talked about people are more in love with their faith than they are in love with the subject of their faith? Who is the subject of their faith? The subject of their faith should be Jesus Christ. So people love the fact that they have faith and that they're Christians more than they love the fact that they love Jesus Christ. So this text here is telling us that we must love Jesus Christ more than anyone else. Okay? Now, let's go to verse 27. What else does, uh, what else does Jesus tell the, the multitude? And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So what exactly is this cross that Jesus is talking about? We know that his cross was represented not only by the physical cross that he bore, but it was also represented by all the things that he had to go through here on this earth. Amen? So if we go back to Matthew chapter 10, where we were just at, and take a look at verse 38, it tells us what this cross is. Verse 38 says, And he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And if you look at the, the commentary on this verse... What it's talking about here is it's talking about loyalty, obedience, and service to our Creator. Okay? But it says that carrying the cross could also mean something that is, is burdensome, something that is, um, a, a, say, a trying time or something that's disgraceful, something that is going to elevate God and lower you. So what it means to carry our cross, it means that we have to put God where He rightfully belongs which is up here, and everything else in comparison must be down here. Amen? The first thing was our relationships, and the second thing is our life that we're living. We may have to change our lifestyle. We may have to live a different life. We may have to forsake things that are getting in the way of our relationship with Jesus Christ. But that's not all Jesus talks about here in Matthew or Luke chapter 14. Let's go down to verse 33. And we're going to go back and read the other verses, but I want to read to you um, verse 33 because I want this to be in order. We talked about relationships first. We talked about the life that we live. What does that look like in comparison to, to our relationship with Jesus Christ? And number three, let's talk about our possessions for a moment. So likewise... Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciples. What does Jesus ask us to do? When he says that you cannot be my disciple, what does being a disciple mean? 
being a disciple means that we have to be teachable, right? So if Jesus is teaching us, what is he teaching us to do? Well, he's teaching us to be able to teach because it's kind of like train the trainer, right? He wants to teach us so that we can go out and teach other people about what? About who Jesus is. So if we are going out and we are teaching people, because if you look in um, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, we're not going to turn there, but it says, go ye therefore and do what? Teach all nations and making disciples of them, right? So what is the first thing we have to do? We have to teach. And then they become a disciple, which means they're going to go out and they're going to teach also. So when we, when we take a look at, uh, at these three things, it's uh, the relationship, the changed life, and possessions. Now, if we were to take a survey right now, you could all probably raise your hands and say, you know what, there are probably some people in my life that I need to discard. And I'm not saying that in a negative or condescending way. What, what I'm telling you is, is that there are people in our lives that are getting in the way of having the type of relationship with Jesus Christ that we should have. Can you all agree to that? There are probably things in our lives that we might need to change. Maybe we spend too much time watching TV. Maybe we spend too much time on the Internet. Maybe we spend too much time working. Maybe we're workaholics. You know, maybe we spend too much time degrading our family. God is telling us that these are the type of things that we need to evaluate, evaluate if we are going to truly set aside our life for someone that we love. Okay? And then, at the very end, it talks about our possessions. There may be things that we have, and this is not, God is not saying that we have to get rid of our house or our car or even our money, or if we have a good job, he's not saying that we have to get rid of that. What he's saying is, take a look at what you have and ask yourself if what you have can be used to bring glory to God. In other words, are your relationships bringing glory to God? Is your way of life bringing glory to God? And the things that you have, can they be used to bring glory to God? So how many of you have ever had a Bible study in your house? So does God want you to just, you know, you have, because you have a nice house, does he want you to go get rid of that nice house? How are you, you going to do Bible studies in your house if you get rid of it? What he might be saying, though, is, you know what, maybe I can't really afford this big house. Maybe I can downsize a little bit and get a smaller house. And then I can use that extra money to lead people to Jesus Christ. Just a thought. I just want you to think about that for a second because as we consider what it means to lay down our life, where it means to set aside our life, God is asking us to look at our relationships because if you look at the research, remember the research that I read to you this morning? People talked in there about relationships. They talked about emotions. They talked about possessions. They talked about uh, living a life as a Christian but not really being one. God is addressing all, Jesus is actually addressing this to the multitude. And it's not the only time that he's ever done this. But in this context, he is. So, what does it cost to lay down your life? Does it cost you anything? People might say, well, you know what, it cost me a lot. You know, it cost me a lot to give this up. Really? Did it really cost you anything? What does, it, what does the cost of discipleship cost to you? And what did it cost to God? Well, we're going to take a look at that right now. Verse 28. We read verses 25, 26, and 27. We jumped down to 33. Now we're going to go back to 28. It says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest... After he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. One of the fundamental issues that I have with Christianity today, as, dis as is discovered as I do my research on Christianity and where it came from and where it's at, is that there are not near as many people today 
that are dedicated to uh, understanding what it costs to be a Christian as there was back, say, even during, uh, let's not even go back to the dark ages. Let's just go back a couple hundred years. People, people were, uh, were willing to give up all kind of things, all kind of friends, and all kind of ways of life in order to follow Jesus. Today, we live a life of distraction. We live a life of contentment. We live a life of ease and comfort. And because we live that way, we are, um, let me see, what's the word I want to use? We are uh, remiss, or we, uh, we choose to follow that path rather than to, to uh, maybe get uncomfortable a little bit and live the type of life that Jesus wants us to live in order to be a true disciple of him. So what does it mean to count the cost? Well, for a builder, as it was illustrated in this text, if I am in the construction industry, which I am, and uh, the people that are telling me to go out and build something, if they have not uh, effectively um, or proficiently done their job, and they said, go out here and build this, and I get halfway through the job and we run out of money, what does that make the company look like? It, it makes you look silly, doesn't it? It makes you look like they have no idea what they're doing. So... In the context of being a Christian, if I go into Christianity, if I say, I want to become a Christian, I want to be baptized, I want to live for Jesus Christ, and I have absolutely no idea what it is that I have to do in order to be a Christian, have I, have I counted the cost before I've gone into this venture? Is there a possibility that halfway through, or even at the beginning of my venture, that I might decide, you know what, this, this, isn't, this isn't my thing? I'm not cut out for this. Well, I'm sorry to say, but Christianity in general, this is what's happening. There are not enough people that are counting the cost before they decide to raise their hand and say, I want to follow Jesus. They're following him because they want to see what kind of things he can do, they're following him just because they're curious. But there's very few that are following him because they truly want to follow him. And um, as I read these statistics, sometimes I, I, just, I spend all kind of time in prayer and I just ask the Lord if he'll just reveal himself to these people. Because God did not turn, Jesus did not turn around to the multitude and tell them these things because he didn't want anybody to follow him. Jesus turned around to the multitude and he told them these things because he wanted them to understand that if you're going to follow me, then these are the things that you're going to have to be concerned with. You know, you might have friends that are going to forsake you because you follow Jesus Christ. You might have a way of life that's going to isolate you from people and things when you choose to follow Jesus Christ. There's going to be certain possessions where you, you may not desire to have those possessions anymore because they don't glorify God. This is the cost associated with being a disciple of Christ. But let's go on because he, he emphasizes the point a little more in verse 31. What king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? So what is it telling you there? Well, if you're a military commander and you have an army of 10,000 people, are you going to sit there and evaluate whether you're going to be able to take the enemy with 10,000 people when you know that his army is twice your number? How many of us have Christians have, these, have has sat down and, and, and figured out, you know, when I become a Christian, it's not going to be easier when I become a Christian but now there's going to be twice as much coming at me as there was before I raised my hand and said, hey, I'm all in. Jesus wants us to be all in, doesn't he? But he wants us to understand that when we're all in, that it could be twice as bad as it was when we weren't all in. But you know what? That's just part of being a Christian, is it not? That's part of being a disciple of Christ. 
That's why Jesus turned around and looked at the people and said, if you want to follow me, bam, 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 bam. He laid it out for him. He said, this is what it's going to cost you if you want to follow me. Now, I'm not sure if any of you have ever read um, Oswald Chambers, but Oswald Chambers happens to be one of my favorite uh, devotional writers. He, uh, he wrote on June 16th, I read this every year. Oswald Chambers, he wrote this book called My Utmost for His Highest or My Greatest for His Glory. And uh, he says this. He says, It is much easier to die than to lay down your life day in and day out with the sense of the high calling of God. What is the high calling of God? The high calling of God is that not only do we share Jesus Christ with people that don't know him, but we explain to them, just as the, the pastor, you know how he's going through this series in Galatians? What is the point? What is, what is Paul trying to tell us in Galatians? He is telling us that we are saved through faith. We are saved through faith by what? We're, we're, we have faith in Jesus Christ, and we believe through faith that we're saved. Amen? So God bestows upon us a, a, a grace that allows us to be forgiven of our sins to, and to allow us to be changed people so that we can go out there and be disciples for Jesus. But the problem is there, there are people in the Bible that we learn about like the rich young ruler. He had a lot of possessions. And I'm sure that he had a lot of friends that were associated with the fact that he had lots of money and lots of stuff. And Jesus looked at him and he said, oh, listen, if you want to follow me, this is what you have to do. And what happened to the rich young ruler? We know that it, he is never spoken of again in the Bible. And when you're never spoken of again in the Bible, or your name's not mentioned, that normally means that things didn't work out too good for you. He gave the rich young ruler the opportunity to come follow him. But he said, you know what, if you're going to do that, these are the things that you're going to have to set aside. Or these are the things that you're going to have to lay down in order to be my disciple. You see, setting, setting aside our life for our friends means, you know what, I'm going to forsake going out to the bar tonight so that I can go to a Bible study instead. Um, I'm going to forsake playing my video games today so that I can go to church. I'm going to forsake um, driving my Mercedes Benz, and I'm not saying that a Mercedes is bad, but I'm just saying if you can't afford that Mercedes, I'm going to forsake driving my Mercedes, and I'm going to downsize to something that I can afford so that I can spend my money leading people to Jesus Christ. See, when, God, when Jesus talks about our possessions, that's what he's talking about. He doesn't want you to give up everything that you have. He wants you to give up those things that are not glorifying him. You know, when we lived in Florida, we bought a house, and not too many people know this, so you're the first to find out. We bought a house in Florida as the, uh, the housing market was on the downturn. And uh, we spent quite a bit of money for this house, um, but my job, you know, afforded us the opportunity to pay for this house. And then, of course, the housing market took a serious crash, and the value of our house dropped $125,000. And on top of that, I was laid off. So we were, um, we were required to pay the same amount of money that we were paying in the beginning. And uh, we didn't have the, the assets to do that. As a matter of fact, um, my son was going to Forest Lake Academy. And for three years, I had to finance his education because, I, because of the situation that I was in. And today, I'm still paying for that, by the way. Um, but we had to sell our house for $125,000 less than we bought it. But because God knew what we were trying to do, we were trying to be more responsible. You know, we, we took an irresponsible approach to buying a house in the beginning. But we were trying to be more responsible, and God says, you know what, I'm going to work something out for you. 
And it just so happened that I was working at Florida Living Retirement Home, and a resident moved in there that happened to be wanting to rent his house in Apopka, which is exactly where I live. And he said, I'll rent it to you for this much, as long as you, if you see something that breaks, you fix it. You know, make sure you take care of the place outside. And you know what? God honored us getting rid of something that we liked a lot, which was our home. And we moved in, we downsized, and we moved into something smaller, and God blessed us for that. Now, am I telling you to go out and do the same thing so you can learn the same lesson? No, learn from me. Okay, don't go out and do that because God might require you to reassess your friendships, reassess your way of life, reassess your possessions if you want to be a true disciple of him. So when we think about discipleship, we talk about grace. And one of my favorite uh, defenders of the faith happens to be Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Anybody who knew Dietrich Bonhoeffer is? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a theologian, and he was also against Nazism. In other words, he wanted to help throw down Adolf Hitler during the World War because he felt that it was an oppression against Christianity. And they were using Christianity as a, as a means of justifying their cause. And he says, you know what? I am not going to put up with this. So he was quiet for a while, and then his voice began to get louder and louder and louder. In um, 1937, he published this book called, it was actually originally titled Discipleship. And then later on, it was titled The Cost of Discipleship. And um, he wrote this in uh, 1937. And he refers to this as cheap and costly grace in the context of being a disciple of Christ. And I want you to, under, I want you to hear what he has to say. Bonhoeffer says that cheap grace is the deadly enemy of the church. We are fighting today for costly grace. Cheap grace means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ. That's cheap grace. But he goes on to say, costly grace... It's costly because it cost a man his life. It is costly because it condemns sin, but through grace it justifies the sinner. And above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. We were bought with a price. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was made prisoner because of his beliefs and because he was involved in this plot to take down Adolf Hitler. They transferred him from, from concentration camp to concentration camp to concentration camp until in 1945, he ended up in Flossburg concentration camp. And in 1945, I believe it was April 9th, April 9th, 1945, they stripped him of all of his clothes, they took him out, and they hung him in the gallows. Now keep in mind, this was weeks before that country was liberated. Did Dietrich Bonhoeffer know something about laying, his da laying down his life? Not only did he literally lay down his life in the end, but all the way up until that point, he laid aside everything that was common to him. He gave up his friends and his family. He gave up his way of life. He gave up his possessions for what purpose? To announce to the world that Jesus Christ is king. So my question for you this morning is, are we willing as Christians to lay down our life for the sake of Jesus Christ? How about for the sake of people sitting in this room? Are we willing to lay, are we, real, are we willing to set things aside so that those things do not get in the way when it comes to leading other people to Jesus. I would like to suggest to you this morning that setting things aside, friendships, our way of life, possessions, and also counting the cost of what it means to be a disciple is not going to be an easy task. You see, Christianity is not explained in the Bible as something that is easy. 
Jesus explains to us that if you want to be a Christian, if you want to follow Jesus Christ, there is a cost. And you know what? If you really think about it, if you have the wrong friends to begin with, if you're living the wrong way of life, and you have too many possessions that you're no earthly good, and you give all that stuff up, it hasn't cost you anything because what have you gained? You've gained everything, right? But we look at everything that we have, everything that, that's earthly, and we can't equate to what that looks like as we give it up. We can't equate that to what's temporal and how that helps in our spiritual growth. But I want to go back to this research here that I started off with. Because as we, as we discussed what it means to be a disciple of Christ and what it means to lay down our life, and let's hope that, God forbid that it's today or tomorrow, but let's hope that when, when God calls us to it, if he does, that we are actually ready to lay down our physical life. Because that could be required of us someday. But hopefully you understand that the focus for this morning was not that. Because we know that that is part of God's great design. That we might have to live our, lay down our literal lives. But more than that, I think he just wants us to take a look at ourselves. He, he wants us to survey who we're associating with, how we're living, um, the stuff that we have, and say, you know what? Is, is there anything that I can do with this stuff here to make my relationship over here much better with you? This research points out a very sad and um, depressing ending. And that is that the reason that people are not falling in love with Jesus Christ today is because when they see people that have the wrong friends, when they see people that are living the wrong life, when they see people that have too much stuff, they're saying, no, wait a minute. Why would I want to follow something like, why would I want to follow Jesus when these people over here that profess to follow Jesus hold him and much have ascribed to him much lesser value than the stuff that they possess. You see what I'm getting at? So people in America today are not becoming Christians. Uh, uh, and what's the word I'm using? They, they're not becoming convicted Christians because they don't see the value in following Jesus when people that proclaim to be Christians are putting more value into their friends, into their possessions, and into their lifestyle. You get that? It's a sad reality. But this research is, um, this is done throughout the world, this research here, and it's all independent. And uh, the Barna Group has become very, um, they become very instrumental in, in pastors and in churches and in denominations figuring out how, how they can address um, things like discipleship, um, true Christianity, and, and, and the things that they can do to bring uh, people into a true understanding and faith relationship with Jesus Christ. So you know what? If, if you ever get a chance, just go to the Barna Group. Uh, just Google it. And you will find out there's, there's tons of research on there that talks about... Um, what Christianity looks like today and why it looks that way. So once we know what it looks like and why it looks that way, guess what we can do? We can figure out how to address it. So I'd hate to, 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 to preach a sermon like this without giving you an opportunity. Um, could you play the organ for me a little bit? Um, I want to give you the opportunity, and while she's going up to the organ... Um, this is another favorite author of mine. His name is John Stott. And if you've ever studied theology, this is one of the authors that you have to read. But um, in The Cost of Discipleship, he read this. And then after this, we're going we're gonna to close. It says, If then you suffer from moral anemia, take my advice and steer clear of Christianity. If you want a life of easygoing self-indulgence, then do not, whatever you do, become a Christian. 
But if you want a life of self-discovery, deeply satisfying to the nature God has given you, if you want a life of adventure in which you have the privilege of serving Him and other people, if you want a life in which to express something of the overwhelming gratitude you are beginning to feel for Him who died for you, then I urge you to yield your life or set aside your life without reservation and without any delay to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That was on the chapter of Counting the Cost. So I believe a sermon like this um, affords an opportunity for people. And you know what? Everybody in here has, they know what kind of friends they have. They know what kind of family they have. They know what kind of possessions they have. You know what kind of lifestyle that you're living. And you know what? That's between you and God. But what I think is important is that you don't have to tell anybody in this room what any of the issues are that you have with anything in your life. But what you do need to do is you do need to let God know what those issues are because even though you know what they are God wants you to confess to him that you know what they are because when you confess to him that you know what they are now you're going to get somewhere because Jesus now through the Holy Spirit is going to transform you and your life is going to be completely different so it doesn't matter if you don't want to get up you don't have to but I just want to make an appeal here this morning because when I wrote this sermon, I wrote this sermon at a time of my life where I realized that stuff had to change. And I asked God, I said, God, just show me in the Bible what you want me to do. And he led me to write this sermon, which was I was writing to myself at the time. And I'm thankful to be able to share it with you this morning. But more than that, if you're willing to reevaluate evaluate the things that we discussed here this morning and decide whether laying aside certain things in your life is worth the relationship that you could have with Jesus Christ, if your relationship is not where you feel that it needs to be because you know some of these things are getting in the way, it's up to you. But, you know, I'd make a bold stand and I'd get up and I'd come down here and I'd say, you know what? In the name of Jesus Christ, I just want you to help me. I want you to help me to forsake all this stuff in my life that I know I just need to either get rid of or things that I need to embrace. So if that's you, I'll be the first one. I'm already up here, so it's a short walk for me. But I'm gonna come down here because you know what? That was me. And it still is to a certain degree. I'm still giving up stuff today. Most of all, Jesus wants disciples that are going to be able to teach things to other people. And people don't want to listen to a teacher if they don't even put any value in the person that they're teaching about. Consider that for a moment. If I'm going to teach about Jesus Christ, but I give him absolutely no value whatsoever in my life, who's going to listen to me? Just remember that grace cost God the death of his son. And of everything in life that we value, that should take precedence. It should be number one on the list. Numero uno. And as we put him at the top of the list, and we say, you know what? He is the most important thing in my life. All this other stuff, these friendships, your possessions, your way of life, it's going to be meaningless to you. Let's pray. Dear God of heaven, dear God, I thank you so much for the conversation that your son Jesus had with the multitude. Lord, I know that I am I was and I still am part of that multitude. 
And Lord, I know that there's things that every day in my life you say, Kevin, you need to forsake this. Kevin, I want you to embrace this because it's a better way. Lord, I want to ask that you please give courage, direction, and, a, and, a, and an extra measure of your Holy Spirit to those people who have, who have had the courage to come up here and say, you know what? My life needs to be, my life needs to be evaluated. And Lord, you know, I know that you're a good, I know that you're good at, at letting me know what I need to do. And it's not that I'm doing anything wrong, but maybe I'm just not doing it quite as good as I should. And Lord, we also know that our life in Jesus is not about the things that we do. But it's about the love relationship that we need to have with the person who is providing that grace. So Lord, just help us to love you. Help us to put you first. And help us to be the disciples of Christ that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name.